Welcome everyone. Today's workshop is all about integrating technologies to foster inclusive interactions in your course. And I think we can go ahead and get started. If we have any latecomers, they can join us or they can watch the recording. So I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Um, if you wouldn't mind, you can either uh, write in the, the chat or you can hop on the microphone, um, but just maybe your name, what you teach, um, and then maybe if you can think of a time where you have observed a technology barrier somewhere in education, uh, whether this is something that you experience firsthand or, or something that you noticed. Go ahead and I'll pause here for you. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I am Lori Townsend. I am a TA in the EDRA department, Educational Technology Research and Assessment. Um, I've been um, teaching there for a little bit now while I'm uh, trying to get through my doctoral dissertation, uh, which I'm currently working on. So in my teaching, technology um, seems to be a barrier for some students in that um, they report either not having reliable internet access or you know they're using their you know mom or dad's laptop they can't always get to it so those are the kinds of barriers that i'm seeing sometimes students don't want to take a lot of time to read instructions and they kind of just blindly um, try to do something on their own and you know they run into some problems that way. Great, thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate it. I love the extra department as well. So yes, um, I, I think you bring up a, a lot of great points here. Um, people are still struggling with reliable internet connections. Uh, Sometimes the equipment they're using, it, it's not even theirs. It can be borrowed. Um, sometimes we have to look closely at the instructions per um, maybe software you're using, per device you're using, um, and it's easy to breeze past those until, until you run into a barrier. So yes, I, I can appreciate all of those scenarios that you just pointed out, so thank you. Bill, I see that you entered in the chat there. So you are a piano professor, and, and you've noticed that there's um, quality of the Zoom sound, uh, frozen videos. Yes, and a lot of this um, can come down to things like bandwidth. Um, again, that the reliability of your internet connection, et cetera. Um, and, and sometimes it can just be Zoom. So yes, I, I hear you. So. you know, I was just curious to see what you had observed as well, you know, as you were teaching uh, most frequent uh, problems, scenarios that we encounter, um, because that gives us a good feel for how we can address those, those situations. And so hopefully um, I can give you some good tips today um, and talk about some specific um, instances of technology that we can you know, work with um, to improve the, the learning experience for our students. So with that in mind, um, you know, I've got a, a little bit of a, an agenda up here on the screen for you, as well as some of our goals. Uh, we're gonna just start off um, talking a little bit about what it means to become culturally responsive. Um, and then we're gonna start segueing right into the different types of technology that we can use to kind of foster this inclusive environment. Um, so we're gonna talk about how to start a conversation with our students through the use of a survey. Um, and then I have five different specific technology tools that we're going to look at um, once we get frequent questions about, and so hopefully I can give you some suggestions for best practices with these. And um, as we kind of wind down, we're going to look at the three types of interactions that our students have, um, and then some quick tech tips, because I, I also think that sometimes we can make just such a huge improvement for our students um, even with small changes. And, and so that's always a nice place to start. So I wanna make sure to include those in there as well. And of course, we'll have the formal wrap up and Q&A, but please feel free to interrupt me at any point during the workshop um, with questions, comments, let me know. I, I'm glad to hear from you as well. Um, so for our goals, we, 
we do want to become our students' advocates. We want to learn these best practices for technology. Um, we want to use it thoughtfully um, and, and you know, make sure that our students have a good experience. Um, and we also want to empower our students to engage in the course uh, because it is a relationship. And so they also have to put forth effort. All right, I think we can begin. So I found this quote and I don't usually um, integrate quotes into my workshops, but I, I really found this one to be very insightful. So I'll let you take a look at it. So, you know, I know this isn't specifically geared towards the use of technology um, in education, but I do think that using technology wisely is largely rooted in being culturally aware of our surroundings. When we improve our course for one student, then we have the capacity to improve it for everyone who is connected to that course. You know, I think it also speaks to this idea that creating an inclusive environment requires a little bit of effort. Um, it can take a little bit of your time, but it's also a necessity. And, you know, finally, as that quote mentions, um, it's not a burden to create an inclusive environment. Um, these are things that we, we should be feeling obligated to do, you know, for all of our students. So um, there are some best practices you can incorporate into your pedagogy um, that won't eat away at your time, um, and it will not disrupt the rigor of your content whatsoever. All right. So now we'll kind of get to the meat of it. Um, the first thing that I, I like to tell faculty is maybe you want to start your semester uh, by initiating a conversation with your students. And so I encourage you to consider distributing a survey um, about your students' access to technology uh, early on. And you'll want to start by clearly stating your expectations for the course um, and try to echo that in your syllabus. So for instance, if you are in a course where you're asking your students uh, to do some type of coding or programming, um, they may need to download certain software. So that's something that you'll want to be upfront about, even if they aren't going to use that software till you know, the mid semester, uh, just let them know ahead of time so that they can make arrangements. And one of the things that I've observed in classes is we have a lot of returning students. We're seeing um, an increase of students coming back to education, even though they've already entered the workforce. And these students may be using computers or laptops that were loaned to them from an employer, but they may not have the administrative access um, that they need to download that software. So it's just kind of a courtesy um, to your students to let them know that this is expected. Um, if they don't have that level of access, then we want to go ahead and help them make arrangements um, so that they can still participate in the course and, and they can, you know, work with their own circumstances uh, to meet the course objectives. Another example of why we might use this survey is um, sometimes we ask students to participate either in synchronous online course meetings um, through either Zoom, Collaborate, or Microsoft Teams, um, or even attend office hours, things of that nature. And you may not be aware of this, but there are some devices out there, such as iPads, that may not support the screen sharing function. Um, you might not be aware of this. Your students might not be aware of this. Um, so it's a great time to kind of take an inventory and see what device are they using to log in to participate. Um, you know, this could, again, be a potential barrier for your students if they are expected to present online. And then probably the third other thing that I would suggest that you include in this survey uh, is ask your students about their Internet access, which I know uh, both of you commented on earlier. And some students do not have reliable service and others may be sharing their Internet bandwidth with a variety of other family members in the home. So from the instructor perspective, you might not be aware that any of this is going on. Um, but as your students are trying to log in and participate, uh, 
they're getting, you know, kind of a lag time, things might not be loading. And so it's good for you to know this upfront as well. Uh, and if you know about it, then you can offer alternative solutions to help these students. So when you distribute the survey, I recommend um, making sure that it's not anonymous. You can tell your students that the survey is for your eyes only, um, but then you can start to build that relationship with your students where you can address them as individuals. After you've distributed the survey, you can look for any maybe potential barriers or conflicts that you just want to keep an eye out for, and you can post follow-up uh, information for all of your students. And this way, if anybody encounters, you know, one of those barriers later on in the course, then that information has been distributed to everybody. So for instance, certain departments have laptops for loan. So you might want to ask if your department is one of them. Um, and also the library has laptops for loan. It's a limited number, um, but they do have them. So you might consider posting information about where they can go to check out one of these laptops, uh, but they're going to need to know, you know, what desk to go to, et cetera. You might also invite your students to help you compile a list of resources because they are very resourceful. Um, if they know of, you know, free hotspots for internet, um, other places where they can check out um, equipment, they're, they're very quick to share these tips with their peers. Um, and it's a great way to include them in the conversation. So uh, they can help you compile a list of resources that maybe even you didn't know about. If you're hosting a session and you know that your students are struggling with internet connectivity, you know, maybe consider recording the session. Um, that way, if they miss anything, they can go back at a later date and time to review it. Um, you may even consider adjusting due dates for certain assessments so students have time to go back and watch that recording and then submit their work. And the other last piece of advice that I have for your survey is to go ahead um, and maybe leave room for an open-ended question. Is there anything else you want me to know about your technology access? So, in a low pressure environment, students may be more forthcoming about disclosing those important details that'll help you help them navigate the course. Questions so far? All right, sounds quiet. So now we're at the point where we can talk about kind of five different technologies um, that we hear a lot of questions about. And so I, I wanted to make sure to address each of these individually. Uh, so the first one that I wanted to mention is um, Blackboard Ally. So as of this past December, NIU enabled Blackboard Ally in all Blackboard courses. So whether you use the Blackboard Original Course View or the Blackboard Ultra Course View, um, you may have observed that there is a capital A next to some of your files. Um, I even put it kind of on this uh, slide here. You can see it outlined in the glowing orange. Uh, so if you've seen that in your course and you know it just randomly appeared and you're not sure what that is, uh, that stands for Blackboard Ally. And you can click on it or your students can click on it. Um, but when you see that, it gives you different options for um, file formats for your particular piece of content. So now you may be asking yourself, well, do I need multiple file formats? I mean, is that necessary? Uh, but one example of why this is beneficial is you may have students with visual impairments and um, if they are using any type of e-reader device, then it may have an easier time detecting and reading certain files over others. Um, so that's one reason why we have this option here. We also know that um, students will click on alternative file formats if they are presented with that option. So we, we've looked at the data um, and there are a number of studies that also um, verify this, but when students have the ability to choose what type of file format um, they would like to access, they do scroll through and click on the different options. So this suggests that students may have a file preference you know, based on their own unique device settings. What works well for the Mac users may be different than what works for the PC users. Um, so again, it's nice just to have a variety because you don't necessarily know what will work best for each individual student. 
Uh, we know that certain files may open faster or load more cohesively than others. Uh, so opting to display your content in a variety of formats is again, kind of speaking to a larger audience. Um, if you have never uh, really toggled around and played with Ally, it also will display an accessibility score uh, to the faculty about their overall Blackboard course structure. Now, I do want to emphasize uh, that it only displays to the instructor. The students do not see this. Uh, but if you click on the score, you can learn about areas of improvement for your course structure as far as accessibility is concerned. Um, so, for instance, if you have included images or links to external content, um, you may have forgotten to include a tag that describes what those images or links are, are about. So again, somebody with an e-reader wouldn't know. Um, now, if this sounds scary, I, I hope it doesn't, uh, Blackboard Ally is designed to help you walk through the process of how to improve the, the accessibility. So I think I have a picture of it. So you can see here, um, this is my, my sandbox, my pretend course. It's actually just filled with probably a bunch of junk, but um, even so, I'm, I'm already at an 85%, which I think is a pretty good score, all things considered. Um, but you know, I, maybe if this was actually a live course, I, I would like it to be better. Maybe I would like it at, you know, closer to 95 to 100%. There are things that I can do um, to improve it. So um, it looks like I have some content with empty headings. Um, I have an image that doesn't have a description. And if I were to click on those actual items, it would tell me how to add the description, how to add a heading. Um, so it walks me through it step by step, even if I'm not sure um, how to do this. So you can access this again, whether you're an ultra user or an original user. For the Blackboard original course users, um, and those are the courses that have kind of that gray control panel going down the left side of the screen when you log in with all the different links. Um, if you scroll all the way down to course tools, uh, the menu will expand and you just click on accessibility report. And for the ultra users, let me go back. Um, Oh, I didn't have a picture of it. I apologize. Um, Ultra users, again, you can also look on the left side of your screen. There's just a few links, um, but you would click on books and tools. And then again, you would click on the accessibility report. Um, so if you're curious to see how accessible your course is, um, according to Blackboard standards, you can you know, check that out too. All right. So the next tool that I wanted to discuss is the ultra progress tracking tool. So as you are probably aware, NIU is a dual deployment university, um, which just means that instructors currently can choose whether they wish to use the Blackboard original course view or the ultra course view. Um, however, we are moving towards adopting ultra exclusively. And I believe Tentatively, we hope to have the majority of NIU courses uh, switched over to the UltraView by fall of 2023, if I'm not mistaken. So I do want to highlight that Ultra has a progress tracking tool uh, that can be turned on to help students engage with their own coursework. Uh, when students view something, and again, this is for Ultra only, uh, but if they view something such as a module, a folder, a document, a shaded in bubble will automatically appear to the left of the content. So it basically looks like a, like a bullet point. And um, you can kind of see um, and the screenshot here where it says welcome and course information. You'll notice that bubble is hollow or empty. That suggests that somebody hasn't viewed it yet. But once they've clicked on it, it becomes shaded in. Uh, this is to alert the student that they've already clicked on something, they may have already viewed it. Um, and then at that point, it's up to the student if they want to click on the bubble. When the student clicks on the bubble, it's replaced with a green check mark. Uh, and that's to remind the student that they've already viewed this content, they are satisfied that they understand uh, everything that they need to view, and it basically becomes a placeholder. 
So if they exit the course and they come back at a later time, then they'll have green check marks next to everything they've completed. It, it's basically working like a bookmark. In the instances where students actually have to submit something for a course, such as you know, a quiz or an assignment, as soon as they successfully submit their coursework, Blackboard will automatically uh, give it a green check mark to remind them that, yep, you've already done this. Um, so it, again, it's helping students to kind of feel empowered that they, they understand their progress, they know what they've completed versus they know what they still need to, to work on. And after this workshop is over, I'm going to send you an email with some follow-up resources. And one of those resources is going to be a link to a demonstration of this uh, feature. So I do want to remind you that this tool is designed to help students interact and keep track of their coursework. There are other tools for progress tracking on the teacher end, but that wasn't our primary focus today. So, um, but you can see where to turn on progress tracking here. I took a, a screenshot of it. It's under, it's on the left side of the screen under details and actions. Uh, typically you wanna try to turn on progress tracking before the start of the semester, uh, before there's any course activity. In that way, then it's on for the duration of the, of the course. So now that we've gone over two different uh, Blackboard tools, we can go ahead and we can take a look um, at another hot topic here. So web conferencing tools have become something of a debated topic throughout this pandemic. NIU offers multiple options for faculty to choose from. We have licenses for Zoom, Collaborate, which is what we're in right now, or Microsoft Teams. But with many of us you know, returning to more of a face-to-face -face presence, um, we've observed that these tools are still very popular. Um, largely, this may be due to the fact that uh, for so long now, all of our web conferencing tools have become part of our, our routine. Um, so since we know that faculty are still utilizing these web conferencing tools, the question then becomes, well, should I require my students to use a webcam? Um, and also, how much influence should I be exerting over my students um, when they're interacting during these sessions? And I think a large part of what this goes back to is that teaching adults um, comes back to this idea that we need to give them choices and options. There's a term, andragogy, which applies to the combined theory and application of how to implement best teaching practices when working with adult learners. Um, and one of the principles of andragogy is that adult learners have already acquired a lot of knowledge um, and skills in their lifetime. And so it's good to give them options in their own education. They, they need to have some of their own control. So you may want to consider leaving cameras as optional during the session. Um, a great way to instill this atmosphere is just by leaving cameras off as they enter the session. Students could turn them on, um, but it's not required. And the same is true for the microphones. Now you might be asking, well, if I can't see them, do I know if they're participating? Um, but the truth is we don't often know what's going on with our students. Some of them may have severe anxiety about sharing their surroundings. Um, and as far as microphones go, students may prefer the text chat for a variety of reasons. Uh, we do know that students have self-identified that um, if they are introverted or if they feel they have a heavy accent, um, that they are more relaxed and more empowered to express their thoughts uh, when they do not have to rely on the microphone. Not that they don't want to participate, but that they have a strong preference for how they participate. And let's see. Well, the New York Times, um, I did also want to mention this as well. Um, they published an article during the pandemic. Um, and the tagline on this article actually read, college made them feel equal. The virus exposed how unequal their lives are, which I thought was pretty intriguing. Um, and this article covered a, a number of different stories. 
but the one that I remember in particular is that there's one student who returned home during the pandemic and had to log into her Zoom classes while she was living out of a food truck with her family. And she discusses how in the classroom, when she was on campus, she felt equal to her peers. Um, I should note that she went to college on a scholarship, but when she ate at the dining halls and she walked to class with her peers, she fit in. During the pandemic, uh, some of her friends would actually go and kind of retreat to an isolated family vacation home, I think on the East Coast. Uh, but this particular student had none of those luxuries or even any type of privacy. So it was a very different scenario for her to have to turn on her, her webcam during these Zoom sessions. So that was my, my one little story that I wanted to include. Uh, but as you think of the web conferencing tools, uh, you may want to think of how your students want to be represented. Um, another idea that you can do with this is you can send out a guest link for everyone to join the session. Um, this way, students can type their name as they want it to appear. Uh, expanding on that, you could even try something. If you've never experimented, um, you may, may want to try one class session just to see how it goes. Uh, where you ask everyone to join the session under a pseudoname, um, such as a, a color or an animal. And as students progress through a series of activities, their anonymity is ensured. But um, at the end of that synchronous course session, ask your students to submit some type of an assessment that reflects their work and their level of understanding of the things that were covered during that synchronous session. Um, at that point, of course, when they turn in their assignment, they should put their name on it. Um, but it, it's a kind of a, a neat experiment to see how do your students interact um, when they log in through a guest link under a pseudoname versus how they interact. Uh, maybe if they came into a session where their name was whatever was printed on the course roster um, and with their, their webcams on, um, it, it can really kind of change the dynamics of your classroom. So I'm not saying you have to do it for every session, but if you've never experimented with it, it's something to consider. All right. And we have another one of our tools here, one of my, one of my personal favorites. I, I've played with this one quite a bit. Um, so Kaltura is NIU's video platform. Um, so kind of along the same lines of hosting your virtual sessions, you may want to consider recording the session and then posting it for students to view at a later date and time. Uh, when you upload your session to Kaltura, you actually are going to find that your session is auto captioned, which uh, has a bunch of uh, potential um, perks and benefits for your students. So. Uh, you don't have to do anything to the auto captions. You can uh, go through there and correct them if you want. Maybe if they got personal pronouns wrong or something like that, you can make revisions. But otherwise, it's actually pretty accurate. Um, additionally, if you put your video recordings into Kaltura and then you insert the link in your course that way, um, just as an added benefit for you, you have eliminated that draw on your limited course storage data. So um, just a highlight for you. Um, something to note is that the auto captioning may help students who may have auditory disabilities, but it is a great asset for uh, a variety of students. And so my example to this is I have worked with a TA here at NIU who signed up for a Kaltura workshop and he was very enthusiastic about it. He said he loved it so much as a student. He wanted to make sure that as he transitioned into his own teaching role that he was sure to use it. Um, so when I asked him, you know, well, why, like, what, what stood out to you about it? He explained that um, he has a very young child at home, an infant. And when his instructors would upload their uh, recorded class sessions or even their PowerPoints uh, to the, to the Kaltura platform, he could watch those videos uh, right next to his sleeping child because he could put the, the videos on mute and just read the auto captions. Um, so again, was that necessarily who this was intended for? Maybe not, um, but it's a service that again can you know, greatly affect all of your students and improve their, their learning experience. 
Um, another an option that you can do with Kaltura, because it is a free video platform for everyone at NIU, is you can ask your students to um, record their own video responses. So for instance, if you recorded a welcome video, you could ask your students to record their own uh, video response as well. Uh, one thing that we have learned throughout this pandemic is that people have a wide range of electronic devices and it can be hard to find consistency. But we do know that most people have a cell phone. So students can actually engage with Kaltura's free mobile application and it works on Androids and iPhones. Um, and so they can just take their cell phone with them, record their own videos, um, at which point they can directly upload it um, you know, to Blackboard. Um, and they can either put it in an assignment. Um, if it's a graded assignment, you will get to see their video response or you could ask them to post it to a discussion board in Blackboard, and that way all of their peers can see it as well. So um, it's not just something for you as an instructor where you have to record your own lecture, they can get involved as well. Um, another Kaltura solution is you can turn your video content into um, an interactive quiz. So we often hear that instructors have posted their recorded lectures, and now they don't even know if their students are watching it. So um, if you use Kaltura to create an interactive quiz, as your students are watching the video, they are prompted to pause periodically and answer a question and then resume the, the video. And as an instructor, you get to decide if you want this to be a graded or an ungraded exercise. So those are just some of the uses that you can do for um, Kaltura. But again, there's more that I'm sure I haven't covered. Um, instructors can record welcome messages. They could do quick demonstration videos or even weekly module introductions. Uh, so with all the video options available, you can find uh, you know, another method to engage your students with their coursework. And you can even invite them to create and share their own content as well. So moving on to another um, hot topic that's highly debated, the use of proctored exam services. The most common tool that we have at NIU is Respondus Lockdown Browser, uh, but we do know that some departments have purchased their own licenses for, I think, Examity, um, which is another option. But typically, we see instructors use the Lockdown Browser option, uh, which prevents students from opening other tabs or windows, uh, potentially you know, to look at notes or to search for exam answers. So, if you are contemplating the use of this feature, you know, I think it's a good idea first just to ask yourself um, a few questions. Um, why do you feel you need this tool? Um, do you, what is it that, why do you think your students are going to cheat? Um, will this tool largely prevent that cheating? Um, if students encounter technical problems, do you feel prepared to troubleshoot the recovery process, right? If they're if their exam freezes, um, are they supposed to stop? Are they supposed to restart their computer? Um, you, you know, if they get locked out, do you know how to get them back in? Um, and also, you know, another thing is to think about what effect do, do these proctored exam services have on your students and their test anxiety levels? Um, they're just all questions that you have to consider. Um, people are going to arrive at different answers, but, but that's something that you should probably factor in before you make a decision. Um, if you are unsure about this tool, then you, know, you might want to consider exploring some alternatives that may incorporate some more inclusive you know, testing practices. For instance, you could set a timer on your exam. I'm not a huge advocate for the forced completion, uh, but again, you know, if you had 60 questions and you wanted them to complete it in 60 minutes, uh, that'll give you a good feel for students who um, have significant you know, differences. If somebody took two hours on an exam instead of one, uh, that could be cause for concern. So that'll actually give you some pretty good insight into what your students are doing um, when they're taking an exam. You know, the idea here is that you, know, you can also do things like you can create a pool um, and I know these are a pool is called um, something different in ultra versus original. So I'll use that term loosely. Um, but again, the idea here is that 
if your test is going to be 50 questions, it is going to automatically pull 50 questions from a pool of 100 or 150 uh, prepared exam questions. So student A is going to get one set of questions and student B is going to get a different set of questions. Um, and that cuts down on a lot of cheating. It does require a little bit of front loading, um, kind of from the instructor perspective, you have to generate a bunch of different exam questions, but uh, it's very hard for students to cheat when they're getting all different questions and they don't know um, what question is going to pop up next on their screen. You may also want to consider um, kind of your overall course structure and the grade weights of your course. So, you know, if one exam is worth a significant portion of their overall grade, I think it's safe to assume that maybe the temptation for cheating is more likely to rise uh, for that particular exam than other areas of your course. Um, so you may want to think about how you structure your course. Do students have to participate equally uh, throughout the duration of your course, or is it set up so there's peaks and valleys? Um, they're, they're masters at knowing how to divide their time. Um, so, so kind of think about it from the student perspective. And you're also going to want to look at, you know, how can you structure this exam, uh, again, to ensure, to ensure this exam integrity. You may want to look for ways to incorporate questions that do not have easily Googled answers, or you may want to try to see if there's a way that you can grade your students on their work. You know, if it's a math, equation, um, not just that did you arrive at the right answer, but how did you get there type of a thing. All right, so now that we've talked about kind of respond to lockdown browser, um, there's also concerns about using the actual monitors or the webcams for proctored exam services. Um, so if you're not familiar with these, this is when uh, students sit in front of a computer and either someone is watching them in live time through a webcam, or in some instances, the students are recorded uh, while they take their test, and then somebody goes back and reviews the recording, um, and they look for any type of flagged movement that may suggest that there was some type of academic dishonesty involved. So um, typically for either Either style of this type of proctored exam, students have to, before they can even begin the test, they have to spin their camera around um, and they have to show all angles of their testing space prior to the start of the test. Um, and this is supposed to help eliminate the idea that uh, books are open, that they have notes, uh, there's electronic devices, or even other people in the room that could help aid them on their test, right? So I, I just bring this up because, um, again, I find it helpful to look at this from the student perspective. Um, there has been a, a lot of debate over the use of this tool. And so when in doubt, I always try to go back to being advocates for our student. And so here are some actual examples of things that have happened uh, with these proctored um, exams. And again, I know we want to ensure our exam integrity, but always ask yourself at what cost. So. Um, here are some examples. We have um, stories of active military students having to try to conceal their location while they're testing. Uh, they cannot disclose any type of information, whether that's a visual cue or an auditory cue of where they're located. Um, typically, active military students do not have quiet testing environments, so uh, it, it's a very uh, real concern for them. There has been an instance of a student who became physically ill during the exam. Now, I don't know if that was testing anxiety or if they were just medically ill, uh, but the student actually asked for permission to vomit, grabbed a garbage can, um, and then afterwards continued on with the test. Uh, there are accounts of students who have been flagged for review um, and they need to conference um, about whether there was any academic dishonesty involved because there were children uh, moving in the background. They were testing from home and their kids ended up in the picture. Um, there has been several instances reported where students were in the hospital. Uh, they felt well enough to take the exam, but then they had to turn on the recording while they were actually in the hospital bed and hooked up to all this medical equipment. And there is, lastly, the other one I had for you was um, students have reported that they were near a window 
while they were taking an exam and they raised their hand and waited for permission to pause and relocate because they heard gunfire outside of their home. So again, these are just some interesting things that students have experienced during the proctored exam services. Um, so I, I do bring these to your attention just because sometimes we don't know what these barriers may, may be for our students. Um, so it's good to kind of look at it from a different angle. And again, if you are still not sure whether or not you want to use this service, again, I would refer to some of those questions that we talked about earlier. Um, will this tool really prevent cheating? Uh, why do I need it? You know, I, and, and look at some of the underlying reasons. Um, if you are afraid that your students are going to share exam answers, maybe it's a time to consider things like, well, how often do I update my exam questions? Um, things like that. So you may choose whichever tool you think is, is best, um, but always try to just think of all possible consequences. Okay, so we're almost, almost done, we're winding down. Um, I do want to talk about a little bit of how students interact. Uh, so now that we've looked at all these different technology tools uh, that we can use to help students engage, uh, let's just take a different look at how students, you know, interact throughout the duration of a course. And we, they have basically three primary relationships. Uh, they can interact with you, uh, the instructor. They can interact with their peers. Um, and then students can also interact with their academic content. Um, so then, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up this workshop, I do want to highlight that inclusive interaction starts with trying to understand your students. Um, I've often heard that inclusivity is described as making sure everyone has a voice at the table. Uh, but I, I think we can expand on that. And I think we could say that it also means making sure that all the voices are heard. Um, and sometimes they can get drowned out. So you are going to want to be sure to ask open-ended questions, invite conversations, um, and be willing to revise and adjust your course content. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing that we need to learn is uh, there may be legitimate barriers present in your course, even if they are unintended and even if you actually had the best of intentions. Um, so sometimes just being willing to listen to your students uh, may kind of give you some insight into some of the struggles that they're they're working against. All right. So also when we think of our technology, um, I know sometimes we think of it in very broad terms. Uh, at this stage of the game, you may already be transitioning back into kind of this face-to-face -face environment. And you might be saying to yourself, but well, my course is face-to-face. -face. Uh, you know, we don't really use that much technology. Um, but again, from the student perspective, they're, they're inundated with technology. It's all around them. So, uh, for example, they may need to log into Blackboard. Um, and so maybe they're using a Blackboard mobile phone application or they're using their cell phone to check their email. They're looking for announcements and reminders online. They could be reviewing PowerPoints um, or links that their instructor has posted, documents. Um, and then they may need to participate in a discussion board or submit exams and assignments online. So technology is all around them, uh, even if we sometimes forget it. And so with that in mind, um, I promised you, uh, I think, a couple of quick tips for um, what you can do to kind of kickstart your course into making it more uh, inclusive. So these are my, my very quick, uh, quick tips for you. You're going to want to avoid the use of distributing photocopies in class. Um, and as I say that, I realize that sometimes people will just find one photocopy and then they'll upload it to their uh, Blackboard course as well. So there's two different forms of how this works. Uh, photocopies tend to be crooked, fuzzy, and difficult to read, even for those of us who have uh, good eyesight. So, and I will be the first person to admit that I've distributed photocopies in class. I am guilty of this as well, but I have, I have changed my mind. Um, so instead, try to incorporate uh, readings that are um, regular documents that can be detected by e-reader devices. Um, additionally, you may consider speaking to NIU librarians about e-reserves. 
the truth is they may already have this text for you um, available in a nice, clean, easy to read format. And if they don't, um, you know, it's a great way to start that conversation because you could say, hey, this is really important material. I, I want to keep covering this, um, you know, in future courses. And um, so then we can start to look for ways to make sure that we include that at NIU's library. Also, um, as a perk, it is guaranteed not to be a copyright infringement issue if the uh, NIU librarians uh, post it to the electronic reserves. So just, a, just an added perk. Okay, the second one. Consider how often your students need to make use of a printer. Um, I know this may sound silly, but um, printers actually are becoming more scarce. So many students do not have easy access to them. Um, so, you know, if you can save them a trip to the computer lab, um, is this something that they could be submitting to you electronically? So just, just to give you an easy option to incorporate into your class. If you are on campus in a computer lab style classroom, also consider how much uh, typing you expect your students to complete in class. I know this could probably be a whole nother workshop topic, but um, we have a lot of different generations in our classrooms now. Some of the older generations did not uh, grow up alongside technology. Um, they, they struggle with it, maybe more than some of your younger students. So you may want to think about, okay, do I have students with disabilities? Do I maybe just have people who um, are not proficient typists? Um, and, and how much typing do I actually need them to do in class? Um, so, so think about that scenario. Are there activities that they can do that do not require uh, lengthy paragraphs of typing? And um, my fourth and last one that I have for you today is to consider asking students for input on how they want to be addressed. Um, and this one could probably make some of the biggest difference in your course as far as the atmosphere is concerned. Uh, consider asking your students to record a quick introductory video um, where they can include their preferred name. Um, sometimes their preferred name is not what is on your course roster or what is on their birth certificate. Um, just what do you want me to call you? How do you, I pronounce it? Um, and give them the option if they would like to include their pronouns. Um, not everybody will include their pronouns, but you know you can always ask them if they would like that known. So those are my, my four quick tips for you. I know we're getting down uh, to about 10 minutes left, so. I know there's a lot of talking, so final wrap up, questions and answers. Um, is there anything that stands out to you? Hi, I think this was some really good information. Um, I, uh, you offered lots of good tips. Uh, I've been wanting to um, investigate Kaltura for a while now, uh, in my online courses that I teach, I will post like, you know, that typical traditional weekly announcement when new learning modules open. And so I find sometimes that students, you know, they just aren't big readers a lot of times, God bless them. Um, and so I've been wanting to like try video announcements and things like that. And so I'm really, you know, interested in learning more about Kaltura and I'm gonna visit the CIDL site and learn more. Great. That Wonderful. was a great I love it. Um, yeah, I work with Kaltura quite a bit. So uh, Lori, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, you know, we can even set up a consultation if you like. Um, I've been beating on that. Sure, I'll hard, so. take you up on that, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think students really do like the the videos. I'm I'm surprised how much they enjoy it. I'm surprised how much they like having the option. You know, can I listen? Can I watch? Um, you know, can I can I read the subtitles? Um, so yeah, it's a great tool. And so, just really quickly, another thing that I am always thinking about is that um, as a TA of a multi-section course, you know, I'm sort of locked into some of the things that I can do. You know, we want all the students across all sections of a course to have virtually the same, you know, learning experience, right? And not vary a whole lot from section to section. So I'm always looking for ways that I, as an instructor, 
can improve or increase my online presence. I'm really interested in inclusive teaching practices. And so, you know, the information that you've shared has really been helpful, really given me some more food for thought as to what I can do to, you know, help my students succeed. Great. Well, I'm glad it sounded helpful. I'm excited to work with you on Kaltura. Um, and, you know, if anything comes up, if you need an idea, you know, maybe even if things just seem kind of stale, um, like you said, you're, you're trying to do the same thing for all three courses. But um, realistically, all three courses are going to be a little bit different because um, it's your students that make each experience a little different. So uh, reach out to us if you ever need any suggestions. Bill, you hate the idea of lockdown browser technology. Um, it, it is an interesting um, scenario. I, I mean, I understand what it what it's attempting to do, um, but it it does cause a lot of snags that I think people don't realize about um, until they're until they're mid tangle. So it's always good to just bring that up, you know, ahead of time and think about it. Um, yeah. If students are are experiencing, you know, tech problems, you know, how, how comfortable are you as a teacher, you know, navigating lockdown browser as well. And um, yeah, some of these stories that I've heard about um, lockdown browsers, my, um, my director was telling me um, they can be very uninclusive. Uh, she, she read an article where a student, um, a, a black student was told to go and get an additional light source uh, because his his complexion was too dark for the to register on the on the recorded um, you know exam session, which is shocking. All right. Well, I'm going to just turn off the recording here.